Okay. You know what? <laughs> yeah. go, go ahead, Dave. <laughs> good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everyone. I'll, uh, I'll cut the first part out. I'm very, very pleased that uh, Mr. Winter has agreed to um, help and assist me and in turn assist everyone else in this um, uh, very uh, pleasantly unexpected recording pertaining to uh, just trying to understand the concept uh, more deeply of more of a deep dive of Planck times golden ratio and all of this. And so um, I, I'm basically trying to understand the concept of Presuming, and I think this is the case, uh, we are living in, you know, again, a, a morphogenetic a sort of hollow fractal world, the spirals, vortices, toroid fields, all of this. The Planck times golden ratio, uh, your equation, sir, seem to literally be the answer that no or many academics globally either refuse to look at or the ones that seem to have some insight don't really speak on too much. All they only say is, oh, you know, they it goes back to the Planck scale. And I, I can't speak past that, so to speak. Would you, sir, be able to uh, elaborate um, mathematically or otherwise from a, an electrical engineer perspective on how that Planck times golden ratio works per se? You know, the first time you asked that question, before we turned the record on, you used the word uh, implosive non-destructive compression, right? Yes. <laughs> right. And, that, and that actually is the key. <laughs> so. so um, first of all, to be very simple and clear, the Planck length and time is the musical key signature of every wave physics has ever measured. So it's literally the musical key signature of, of the universe. It's a very shareable wave. Uh, and so it appears to be uh, that, for example, gravity radio depends on tuning to Planck. It's absolutely clear. And the fact that Planck is the same, you know, 100 million light years in all directions is a pretty good indicator that somebody has agreed on something. <laughs> so we start there. And, and the other thing is that um, <clears throat> implosive, uh, or what Einstein called, quote, infinite non-destructive compression, is a name for a phenomena of waves of charge when they enter a certain array and visualize a pine cone vortex down that perfect 60 degree implosion tone, that when the charge compresses only in that way, uh, the waves add and multiply constructively both wavelength and phase velocity. And as the phase velocities add and multiply recursively constructively only enabled by golden ratio, um, the compression of charge because of golden ratio fractality becomes acceleration of charge toward that center named the gravity. And the reason it's non-destructive, implosive and non-destructive, is the charge then is able to accelerate with only constructive wave interference. So the inertia is not lost. What Einstein, he knew that there was, in, there was a non-destructive compression going, but he, he didn't, couldn't figure out where the charge went out through the center of the tornado. That's right. why he didn't know why an object falls to the ground and never figured it out. In fact, we now know exactly what happens because the waves are adding and multiplying precisely to the Planck threshold, which is literally the tip of the pine cone. At that Planck threshold specifically, sufficient inertia is assembled non-destructively where the up and down uh, transverse electromagnetic inertia is converted just at that point of Planck, that the burning hole at the center of the eye of the needle, as it were, the eye of the tornado, just at that compression point, the up and down inertia, which is uh, doesn't propagate as far, is converted into longitudinal compressional inertia. And this, so there's a squirt gun out through the speed of light into longitudinal coherent EMF interferometry, electromagnetic field. And that longitudinal EMF wave directly by Bearden's equations is what a gravity wave is. Uh, this is just to clarify, uh, former uh, Lieutenant Colonel, Mr. Tom Bearden, who Tom, passed away. Tom, yes, in, in his book, Gravitobiology, for example, all the links at the bottom, fractalfield.com slash vacuum energy. Not only does he describe this as the mechanism of biology and how gravitation feeds biology, for example, longitudinal wave grows the plants beautifully in a pitch black basement. So that longitudinal wave is the substance of gravitational wave interferometry. That's Bearden's equation. So it's very simple, actually. It's not even hard to figure out that the inertia at that center found a way through the speed of light using golden ratio into a longitudinal array, which is the gravity field, which is why 
all of interstellar wave mechanics, most of it is based on golden mean ratio, because that's the only way you get gravity to be stable from spiral arms of galaxies. Golden ratio is all over the solar system's planetary orbitals. It's everywhere you look, not just matter in biology. So it's not just beauty, it's about constructive wave interference. So the way out for charge at the center, literally a squirt gun for charge at the center of the golden ratio vortex. And, and so that's why it was so profound when I discovered that you take Planck and multiply by integer powers, exponents, and golden ratio, you get exactly three radii of hydrogen. That's the smoking gun that no physicist can deny. It cannot be a coincidence. So what is it? It's how fractal hydrogen makes gravity. First, it's proof that hydrogen is fractal because golden ratio perfects fractality, self-similarity. And it's the smoking gun that proves how hydrogen is making gravity. Forgive me, uh, sir, if this is a little bit of a, a basic question, but does this speak to potentially uh, what's called scalar waves? If I'm not mistaken, their scalar waves are, uh, there's no uh, specific direction in which they travel, but only in magnitude, which speaks to spinners? Well, yes. Um, you know, when I first started doing lectures internationally for psychotronics, we were all mystified by what's called a scalar wave. You take a, a piece of wire and touch it to your car battery and it'll melt. But if you wind, wind that wire into, into a caduceus, the wire stays cool. But when you point it at someone's belly, they feel nausea. You made a gravity wave. And we couldn't figure out that physics. Now we know exactly what that physics is. What was called a scalar wave or even Vril is in fact an introduction to specifically the physics of coherent longitudinal EMF interferometry and nothing else. So everywhere you see the word scalar, you think ah, implosive compression into longitudinal plasma projection. That's what scalar means. And yes, that array of the longitudinal nose has very specific requirements that, that compressional inertia will pass through just about anything, go through a Faraday cage, no problem. Right. But where it bounces again at another compressional node, the earth grid, dodeci coast of the sacred space, that then that there is a interchange of inertia again between longitudinal and transverse. And that's why this is the holy grail secret to achieving heat containment at a distance, the holy grail of all fusion energy research is longitudinal interferometry, actually. So and sorry, uh, before you go on, sir, when, just wanna quickly um, refresh this, just, just to write this down. So you said when you, you, anyone sees the word scalar, we think of, imp we should be thinking of implosive compression into- Longitudinal coherent interferometry, absolutely. The word scalar, and sometimes even the Russians use the word torsional. Well, of course, a rotational component when it became spiral and implosively compressional introduced longitudinal. So this, the Russians were using what they call torsional, which is scalar, longitudinal EMF, because they got the microwave guys after World War II from Germany. So they knew scalar waves long before, and that was Tom Bearden's complaint. He called it the Russian woodpecker. Right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, okay. Wow. This is, got you. So this explains... <laughs> This almost in my humble opinion, and I'm very confident in saying this now after many, many months of personal research, this seems to explain the, everything. And I'm not trying to be overly vague, but it, it, it's no, certainly- No, it's, it's the physics of the reason gravity exists. It's the, reason, the physics of the reason all negentropic and self-organizing forces exist like life force and focus human attention. It's the physics of the reason consciousness exists. Because when you implode, which is recursively turn inside out plasma and those donuts, you embed in that array. And that is the physics of the origin of life. It's what the difference between life and death for a seed. It's the, it's the physics of why children see without their eyes. They report a plasma tornado. And it's the reason objects fall to the ground. So if I could put up on the screen here, just a very basic diagram that I've seen in, in presentations, I think uh, actually roughly around the time that the Soviet Union collapsed, interestingly enough, uh, there's been, you know, many scientists have come around saying, okay, uh, you know, advocating for what's called the zero point energy approach. You have particle fluctuations that continue to push the particles into the vacuum and the vacuum then spits them back out. And it's just a cosmological feedback system. Would you agree with this? Um, that's an introduction to a vortex pine cone kissing nose tuned to Planck. But understanding that the implosive compression that puts it in that array is the tuning to Planck. So the, where the inertia is exchanged with the vacuum is specifically at the Planck threshold where it gains the critical inertial escape velocity to go superluminal. The second smoking gun for your physics professor is that in Raymond Chow's hundreds of measurements of velocities faster than light, 
they were almost all between 1.5 to 1.7 times C light speed, meaning 1.618 times C, the speed of light, is the center of the most common measured velocities faster than light, Professor Raymond Chow. If that's true, that's a smoking gun that this is how gravity is created because it's the only way through the speed of light, constructive wave interference by implosion due to golden ratio phase conjugation. Wow, okay, so this speaks to what we see within history of the touching pine cones constantly. Exactly, right. yeah. Right. You line up the perfect pine cone, you get hydrogen, you get consciousness in your brain, you get galaxy wave mechanics, you get gravity stability, and you get how black holes become angel black bodies in plasma intelligence. It's all about that symmetry. So if we follow this, again, this very basic model or diagram and presuming that the vacuum is all around us, uh, or, you know, as they say, would you say that there's been a confinement to the light spectrum in which we observe and, and touch and sense uh, holofractally in all of this because there's been a confinement from the vacuum? Well, <clears throat> the vacuum doesn't get to exchange inertia faster than light except at the fractal sacred nodal geometry. So at these longitudinal nodes, for example, the sacred earth grid magnetic line cross point Dodeki Koso, where Bruce Cathy measured dramatic reduction in nuclear critical mass and where Kozirev measured dramatic ability to achieve military quality telepathy. Those are the radio standing wave node points into what the aboriginals called song line dreaming track. And that was gonna be, you, you already spoiled the surprise, that was gonna be our new lecture about how you talk to the divine intelligence. That the reason there's rainstorms when, when aboriginal ancestors die is because those magnetic worms are self-aware. And if you inhabit the same land for a hundred generations, that worm steers you and vice versa. Wow. Okay. So now I did want to ask as well, sir, and I don't mean to be jumping all over the place. I'm just reading this, um, uh, this basic definition just for the audience here. Uh, top, uh, the concept of topology concerned with the properties of a geometric object that are preserved under continuous deformations like stretching, twisting, crumpling, and bending without closing holes, opening holes, uh, tearing, gluing, or passing through itself. Would you say this is a state potentially in which we are currently, uh, I don't want to say confined in, but residing in, if that makes sense? Well, let's use two practical examples. The concept of pelastration, when recursive braiding in DNA, it turns inside out, or yeah. in the Steiner-esque seven stages of invagination, when the sperm delivers the ca capacitive wave to the egg that causes it to dimple and turn inside out called fertilization. There's seven stages to that invagination or recursive turning inside out process, which we have films in the last, uh, visuals in the last film we made. So those are an example, but in terms of membrane theory, I would remind you of structural stability and morphogenesis, Rene Tone and um, uh, laws of form Brown. Basically what they're saying is that the physics reason why immune health equals directly the harmonic inclusiveness of the membrane foldedness. So, the foldance of the membrane is a frequency signature. And the more harmonics there is measurably how much immune health you have. It's called fractality and heart rate variability. So if your membrane has lots of folds in the cell membrane, that's called immune system. If that, if that cell is a sphere, that's called cancer by definition because it lost harmonic inclusiveness. So that's an example of non of contiguous foldedness in membrane theory. And that feeds directly into Bruce Lipton's famous, you know, the membrane is the brain of the cell because it's fractal. So the fractality of folded surface. And so you could use that model of fractality of folded surface equals mindfulness in general to apply to, well, are we, are we, are we stuck in a, <laughs> in a little cocoon? In this case, our little cocoon is, we do not get to see through the speed of light into that longitudinal interferometry unless we embed those harmonics. Now, if you get golden ratio brainwave bliss harmonics and you're at one of those great standing wave nodes, you're at least a magnetic line, you're gonna start lucid dreaming. And not only that is, is that a predictor of successful death, but that's exactly what you're saying, how to get out of the cocoon. Okay, now I, I did want to speak, speaking to your point there, sir. Um, I've been recently watching many different presentations, uh, across, not just within North America, but around the world that have stated that what has been commonly known as the God particle within us is actually, if we, if you look, if one were to look at it and observe it, it's in a, a, the, the form of what we call a coil, and that it, 
what you have to do in order to activate what's whatever is within ourselves is to unravel that coil. Does this make sense to you by, by any chance, perhaps? You know, I think what physics conventionally calls the God particle is the, you know, the infinite subatomic little bubble uh, is pretty unhelpful. And then they hypothesize that everything, including gravity and others, is caused by this little God particle, which is totally hypothetical and really unsupportable. It's almost as stupid as the idea that dark matter exists only invented because they couldn't figure out why there's extra gravity around because they don't know what causes gravity. So obviously the Earth's the universe's masses are arranged in a dodecahedron, well proven because that's how you stabilize gravity. So there's where the extra gravity came from, making the idea of dark matter stupid, which is similar to my view about the God curve. However, to your point about the spiral being the ultimate subatomic bubble, slipknot, uh, I call to your attention every single clairvoyant occult chemistry, lead beater and basant, First, they saw that spiral slipknot, seven spins outside, five spins inside, Anu at the heart of the sun, and then they saw it at the heart of the human, literally seven layers of heart muscle or that angle of seven spins, et cetera. And then they saw it at the heart of hydrogen, three Anu per quark, and they predicted in advance the subatomic physics of quark geometry, three Anu per quark, documented inside perception of quarks by Phillips. So there was a spiral slipknot that inhabited, and it, it's about unpacking, but now we know why. They drew the Anu as seven spins outside, five spins inside, simply because they couldn't draw accurately or imagine the seven spins is the seven spins is the tetracube, and the five spins is the spins of the dodecicosa. And that slip now turning set out when you put a tetracube inside a dodecicosa, you get implosive con compression, and that is the slip now. So the Anu is really a name for how tetracube embeds in dodecicosa, enabling perfected implosion, which defines the electron shell geometries, for example, of noble gases and <clears throat> uh, gold, palladium, platinum, the platinum group metals. Wow. Okay. So I'd like to share this image very quickly with you, sir. And this is from a good friend of mine, Tom, Mr. Tom Matt. He had this illustrated for him on a, on a, a an article he wrote to try and explain to people what he sees when he remote views, or, or at least uh, attempts to. This speaks to, again, the arrows don't literally represent the five spins in, seven spins out, but does this speak to that? Oh, it's beautiful. I mean, it's a, a tornado inside a tornado, absolutely. And in fact, when vortex turn inside out recursively, that's precisely what it is. And if you ever, I mean, we talk about, you know, clairvoyantly watching a shaman steering a tornado and you watch the bioplasmic streamers from the belly of the shaman embed in the center of the tornado vortex and then he's steering the tornado because the tornado fell in love with him. Well, actually that's the plasma physics of perfected embedding. And obviously steering tornadoes is a very good introduction to remote viewing, absolutely. That's very useful. Wow. Now, if okay, so now uh, please forgive me if I'm if I'm being very vague here, but I wanted to so essentially uh, just sketch this out very quickly. The concept of again the, the spiral, the 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 vortex when one remote views, there seems to be um, and again because I'm not a mathematician or anything like this, I don't. I wish I knew a little bit more, but there seems to be something with the numbers. Uh, again, three, five, and seven. Now that speaks to, of course, your five spins inward, seven spins outward. But this concept of geometry and how, when you know, for example, people claim that you know you have the three D here, the five, and then the seven. Does this mean, for example, that we are currently in the three dimensional state and what we are observing when what we call uh, lucid dreaming or anything like this, astral projecting, are the five D and seven D states, or am I totally off with that? Um. Well, first of all, uh, we've talked about the five, seven spins, and that's correct. And, and obviously, we know that the trinary, the permutations of three, is not just the codons of DNA and the origin of I Ching, but it's well, all periodicities are based on permutation of three. So obviously, that is very useful. It's more than numerology. It's actually wave mechanics, so it's useful. However, we have lectured dozens of times on the physics of what we mean by going to the next dimension, and we are absolutely crystal clear that each time you superpose the next X is a superposed charge spin symmetry, which will always show up in the frequency signature. That's the only de definition of going to the next dimension that ever existed. So for example, you get the thread of DNA and you braid the braid of the braid of the braid. And those longer wave coherent braid embeddings only happen in DNA in the presence of low frequency phonons, coherent EKG and EEG, the physics of bliss. So the reason you're going to the next dimension because the next long wave braid embeds in DNA, we've measured that. So the next dimension is the moment when the next X is superposed, spin embeds a longer wave, shows up in the power spectra. And yes, it's true that beyond three and five spins, 
the only superposed way you can add more X is spin symmetry constructively is golden ratio. That's why, you know, you got a tetra cube in the DNA, but then when you braid the braid, it's all dodeca ratchet. Every superposed axis after that is golden ratio. And that embeds a longer and longer wave in your aura, which is implosively centripetal. And that's the only meaning ever of going in the next dimension. So when these people say, are you 5D yet? It's essentially saying, are you still enough in your bliss to feel a very long wave? That's all they mean. So when, okay, so when you speak of very long waves, for me, as someone, as someone that visualizes, I think of, again, a, a very long frequency wave. Is this, and I, f- not to get, you know, um, tinfoil hatty or, or anything like this, but is this potentially why globally there's been um, uh, no uh, major funding or appropriations of funding towards um, investigating what goes below the delta spectrum, at least in, a, in an official capacity? Because it seems like that is where the, the dare I say, answers reside in that regard you mean delta in the eeg in the brain wave yes sir yes yeah. well um you know alpha is cl- classically is the schumann harmonic actually and alpha is the, beginning to embed in the, in the bliss process and uh, beta which is more active thought but then the lower frequency uh, uh the theta and then delta the theta is called access to the unconscious. And it's kind of access to a dream space and literally access to lucid dream. And I do find after 30 years of Kundalini, I have huge theta, actually I do. Uh, And uh, if you can remain awake and still make theta, (laughs) or if you make theta with your eyes open, (laughs) that means you're ready to lucid dream even with your eyes open, it's incredible. So, and then the lower than that Delta, much longer wave would require the kind of attention which would in, uh, inhabit a very large field. Most people would call that narcoleptic, but to be able to inhabit that long wave coherently would require great practicing, for example, lucid dreaming in my view, and would indicate an advanced state of consciousness. It's true. It's interesting, you know, the higher frequencies like the, what they call the Tibetan gamma up 44 Hertz uh, is right where the Dracos live <laughs> and they have that vice-like grip. So the higher frequencies enable telepathy, but the lower frequencies enable empathy. Wow. Okay. So, and, and uh, forgive me, I don't mean to just, you know, uh, throw things in your face by sharing the screen here, but I did want to ask, uh, pertaining to this particular um, uh, paper here, speaking to uh, DNA modifications through remote intention, it speaks to, uh, I want to point out here, uh, biological non-locality between the intention produced by the group and the effects on DNA. To, to me, this speaks to precisely the spiral, the vortex, whatever, you know, what we call, quote unquote, imagination is really the way that when someone speaks to a plant, for example, when they talk positively and think positively towards that plant, it tends to blossom more um, uh, in a more fr- fruitive way, if that makes sense. Um, does this does this resonate with with your own work? And I don't mean to just throw up a, a paper in your face like this, but I, I couldn't help but think of again DNA modifications through remote intention. Nothing technical, just again looking, focusing, and being able to alter that state. And I, that's a beautiful and useful example. And, and plant healing this described, you know, I was with Marcel Vogel for years when he was doing plant polygraphy and he was there with his crystal focus on the plant. And sure enough, the plant was picking it up every time I, I helped build that polygraph, you know? So, uh, but, but the, the physics is simple that when the DNA braid becomes recursively coherent, it can project a coherent longitudinal wave. And when that wave crosses with another compression point at a distance, then it resynthesizes some of the transverse up and down heat contained components. So all action at a distance, which Einstein incorrectly called spooky, begins with understanding the physics of longitudinal interferometry, especially the part of the fact that those longitudinal waves have a potentially infinite series of harmonics of golden ratio times speed, light speed embedded in them, which is why those stargates get go galaxies away in seconds. It's because that, that nesting gets to extreme compression at that center point of the portal. So the physics of action at a distance, the DNA is a great introduction to that in plant polygraphy and telepathy and song lines. But actually, you know, that's why we want to do this film about you know, the physics of the divine intelligence or the supreme consciousness, because actually there's a great number of physics clues to how you can be part of the divine intelligence better, like leave the electrosmog and the steel and aluminum building and find some nature and embed, you know, the Jedi and all that stuff. So the, the divine intelligence is more available if you know the physics. 
Now, would this be uh, this, this concept of, again, you know, remote intention speaking to, to plants and they blossom more beautifully uh, and yeah. blissfully and all of this, would it be more, um, let's say we took those plants and we put them inside of a, um, uh, let's say a Faraday cage with a, with a quantum chip, as they call it, and you, uh, you isolate all of the quote unquote noise within society and all of that, would the plant theoretically blossom more, say, quicker, m more healthier, if that were faster, if that makes sense, because all of this, what we call noise and scrambled frequencies all around us is, is being isolated? Well, let's make a few very basic points. You know, Ingo Swan heated that thermistor with the mind, his mind at a distance repeatedly in a Faraday cage. And we know exactly what made it through the Faraday cage, the same wave that Bearden proved is the physics of why the seed germinates. It's the compression node made centripetal of a longitudinal field. That's, the, that's life or death for a seed. Otherwise, it, it can't suck and it has to really suck. <laughs> uh, so the seed grows because it got implosive and it gets implosive because the array around it is centripetal enough called a longitudinal wave node. So that's obvious why this plants grow faster. If you pray for them, you're setting up a centripetal field. Field and centripetal is the reason why most ancient pyramids and stone circles primary use was zap the seeds. <laughs> so, so, so that longitudinal field will absolutely go through that Faraday cage. And it is true that the plant uh, may benefit in the Faraday cage from eliminating some of the transverse junk electrosmog outside of it. But basically that plant is always gonna do better in nature. And uh, you know, that's why people say, well, will I get more bliss in my bedroom if I install a Faraday cage? Well, you may achieve isolation, but <laughs> you, what you're really looking for is perfect embedding. And that's the opposite of isolation. And perfect embedding, which speaks to, in my humble opinion, potentially, please tell me if I'm wrong, Tom Bearden's uh, 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 seemingly correct uh, proposal of how, how the, the, uh, perfect, the centripetal wave got through the Faraday cage. Does that also speak to um, Sir Roger Penrose's Emperor's New Mind book from the 80s, you know, collapsing the wave uh, to, to break the node? Perfected wave collapse is an excellent and useful language for all of this. It's absolutely useful language. However, it's quite ignorant to not understand what perfective wave collapse is. The only solution to perfected wave collapse is precisely golden ratio times Planck. That's what you've shown. And so, for example, when they show that even microtubules, Stuart Hamroff, they're saying that's conscious. So, well, actually, there's some wave collapse going on there, but that's only the introduction to the long wave implosive wave collapse in the plasma tornado that's inhabiting your whole brain, which is why conscious you know, kids seen without their eyes see a tornado form. That's the whole brain plasma vortex doing perfected wave collapse. So it is absolutely about perfected wave collapse. And by the way, Nassim Harum did some fun work with Penrose tiling, showing if you map the Planck onto the surface of the, of the sphere and show the, the, the multiples thereof create the geometry for perfected wave collapse. So, you know, mm -hmm. they, they were all talking about the same thing, but they just didn't get to the point, <laughs> which is Planck right. particle ratio. Okay, so this speaks to the, the sorry, not this. Does this speak to the concept of when, very sadly or unfortunately, someone passes away in the physical? If they don't know how to self-compress, and I, I dare I say, part of that self-compression is alleviating what we call stress, anxiety, and all of that. If they don't know how to self-compress, they become very fractalized, scrambled, which which creates all these different you know waves and all of that. That is not the centripetal wave. Does that have anything to do with it as well? Absolutely. In fact, that's an introduction to the hygiene of successful death and how to enter a lucid dream, both specifically and exactly. Namely, that the aura needs to become very still and very compressed and very focused. And then it becomes centripetal enough to reach that critical threshold, Egyptians call the ba from the ka, and propagate a longitudinal array coherently. And then your attention can embed and inhabit the larger array. As we've said before, you inhabit an array already. It's called the synapses in your hologram optical cortex. However, if you want to inhabit a bigger array, the earth grid, then you may have to refine the quality of that attention. And that's exactly what successful death and lucid dreaming are about. Any aboriginal could tell you. And, and to, to cite the, 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 the term biological non-locality, because our DNA is non-local, does that speak to, say, for example, whether someone is doing this without psychedelics or with psychedelics? A lot of people that can hold, it, um, hold that experience long enough claim, oh, you know, Dave, I zoomed out on the macro and I saw all these different spiral galaxies. Then I chose one and I zoomed in. 
Does that speak to the non-locality? Because we are everywhere and nowhere simultaneously, we can access all points in space and time? You see, I, I think the term non-locality, while appropriate, is too vague. Okay. And to say that we're everywhere where at once is also perhaps too vague, because specifically, uh, I would say, for example, if you talk to the medical doctors who died on the operating table and remembered where they were looking from when they died, this is medically proven, right. not one of them looked from the inside of a metal steel cube, not one of them, no. A metal steel cube, like some buildings, is uninhabitable for consciousness because plasma can't implode there. So you, you no, in fact, you can't be everywhere. There's some places you can't be. And one of them is inside aluminum cubes because the capacitance is opposite to high dielectric and therefore charge distribution and therefore the opposite of sacred and life ain't possible there. That's called misqualified energy. So yes, you can inhabit the array and yes, you can do action at distance, absolutely. But there's some very definite physics which determines how successful you will be in getting into that bigger array. This, this scene's new, you know, you do the the sun gazing at sunset during the equinox right on the water when the sun set the green flash. This is called longitudinal coherence, the physics of, of, uh, of Agni Hotra. So, so it's not everywhere. It's not everywhere. No, it's right. where, the, where the longitudinal coherence is possible. That's where you can have, and that's where you can have communion with the great spirit and the divine intelligence and the supreme well, consciousness. Would on a very, very scale, to your point, sir, on a very, very scaled down version of this or perspective of it, would the Kashmir effect by Heinrich Kashmir be um, a, a potential example of that, confining the cavities and the photons that don't de-excite as you put them into more cavities or spirals? The Kashmir effect, I believe, had to do with uh, micro resonances, uh, okay. which, for example, if you had two super flat metals, and they might actually bond atomically if they, and so the Casimir effect will phase lock between. There's lots of interesting, and there's some quasi superconductive, nonlinear, quasi zero point kind of phenomena accessible from the Casimir effect. But basically, it's just referring to very uh, high frequency noise in the quantum foam, in a sense. So it's not exactly to point here. I don't think. Got you. Wow. Okay. So that would mean. Wow, that makes sense. So that explains why. Okay, so when some going back to the example of the doctor in a hospital, mm, because of the fact that there was no self implosive environment for them to embed in, that's why they were viewing their physical body way. I mean, it's it's um, that famous Ray Moody, wonderful talking about all the medical surgeons who came back from their death experiences and documented where in the room they were looking from when they were watching another sur surgeon drill a hole in their head. They were dead, but they were looking at it from outside their head, but they were not looking at it from inside anything steel because you can't look from there. There's a clue. Got you. And that, oh my gosh. Okay, God, thank you so much. Now that, the, okay, now I'd like to share one more um, paper here with you, sir, and it speaks to um, the 12-strand uh, DNA morphogenetic engineering, hollow fractal morphogenetic reprogramming of genetic information. Um, again, for, forgive me uh, for, you know, just throwing this in your face so uh, abruptly, but I, I wanted to point out particularly it speaks on scalar waves and all of this, but we see here in this particular paragraph, subsequently, the magnetic base codes of present day human, a, uh, human DNA strand blueprints, one, two, three, four, seven, 10, 11, presently operate in reverse, um, making DNA uh, strand interlacing or stargate passage via transmutative transharmonic accretion and perpetual life potentiality impossible. Does this speak to when I see in reverse? Am I over? Am I over analyzing when I think of the concept that we that we may be confined into a sort of a um, uh, inverted state of of quote unquote reality? Um, well, uh, I think we could say some things are clear. Uh, the the concept of twelve strand DNA, most biologists would simply laugh and throw that paper away. However. Um, Actually, that metaphor has some use in my view in that if you look at the symmetry of the ratcheted dodeca, which is the primary symmetry of the helix, it's obviously five spin based. And then if you take that thread, a ratcheted dodeca, which is five spins inside, and then you braid that and braid the braid the braid on the braid seven times, and then the, the DNA becomes so thick, it almost turns inside out like a donut. 
So now you have seven spins outside and five spins inside. And you could call that 12 strands, but it's actually 12 superposed wave harmonics based on five spins inside, seven spins outside. So, the, so saying 12 strand DNA is an idea which biophysicists will say that's crap and they're right. But when they look at the coherence of the long wave braiding that becomes phase coherence in the presence of human bliss, then seven spins of the long wave and five. So the 12 strands has some meaning in that sense. And the codon sequencing I, does have to do with sort of Fibonacci sequences. There's all kinds of codon sequencing. And I don't think I can even comment specifically on your question one, two, three, five, seven. However, I, I can say that uh, what is clear is that what used to be called junk DNA and presently called non-coding DNA is a name for the very important physics that the spacing of the long waves between where the DNA helices line up is determined by the braiding of the long wave phonon coherence EKG EEG, which we have measured, which is the physics of then how DNA is literally biophysically programmed because the alignment of the active sites are triggered by the braid phase coherence. So active site alignment requires that long wave embedding symmetry, meaning that it shouldn't be called junk DNA or even non-coding DNA. It should be called the array symmetry, which enables the alignment that, it, it, that triggers uh, which RNA codons get access to replication. Wow. Okay. Now so th this takes me, thank you so much. This takes me to my last question here. And you brought up the um, uh, Fibonacci sequence. And I I've recently delved into something that's called the Tribonacci sequence. And the Tribonacci sequence, apparently, whether geometrically or mathematically, is um, is just a scale up of the Fibonacci, but it is harder to produce than it is to prove, whether geometrically or mathematically. Does this speak to um, that concept of topology and how we may be, uh, again, I, I don't mean to uh, appear to be fear-mongering or, or anything like this, but uh, be confined within a particular light spectrum geometrically that, that it makes it difficult for the Tribonacci sequence to be produced? Uh, rather, uh, you see what I'm saying? Yeah, I, I do try to be quite careful that I'm only interested in speaking about geometry, which predicts wave mechanics. Uh, otherwise you're lost in woo woo numerology. But I'm not saying that Tribonacci is not useful, but to my knowledge, it hasn't been proven to predict anything in wave mechanics yet. However, uh, the, the reason, for example, we talk about a Fibonacci sequence is because it's simply a logarithmic approach to golden ratio. And it is literally how plants achieve maximum exposure, minimum superposition, and perfect packing, et cetera. So uh, Fibonacci is very useful for biology, absolutely. And the Tribonacci is probably an introduction to another form of unpacking. But the real core to your question is, your, I mean, your question is basically, are we trapped here? <laughs> I mean, that's your question, yeah. And, try, and trying to figure out the, the, if we are the composition of that trap. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it's the film of The Prisoner, you know? <laughs> you remember the other ancient movie? You know, well, wait, it's, or what's that? There's a famous movie about the guy that's in this artificial, I didn't realize it, an artificial environment. So what is the nature of the trap? The nature of the trap is that you cannot unpack your attention into the larger superluminal longitudinal array, heaven, plains of Sharon, which is the Bob and the Ka, which is, where you go when you lose a dream and where the aboriginals go when their eyes are closed and they're navigating the song line and they're changing the weather down the song line, okay? Your ability to go there depends on getting very still in the short wave so you can have, inhabit the long wave called longitudinal. And that is the only way out of the trap. That's why practicing lucid dreaming is so useful because it's literally not just the way through death but the way to get immortal which is why the Templars used the three days dead in order to initiate, they were called Christ, because the near-death experience is actually the perfect practice. Wow, okay, so the Templars, them, and that speaks to me per, uh, personally, the, the Templar three days dead on the uh, the three, five, and the seven, right? The the, the five yeah. spins, well, yeah, it, it right. Was, you know, and we got to credit Freddie Silva, that's what he figured out, you know, the whole Jesus Templar mystery is about the fact, and even the, the Voynich manuscript, it was actually, you know, it wasn't just a, you know, painless suicide. That's what they said, the herbs and the Voynich manuscript. No, this was the Templar recipe for achieving a stable near-death experience so you could inhabit the bigger array. And when you came back, 
<laughs> you were initiated. What that initiation literally is defined as the ability to inhabit the long wave array. Wow. Well, I want to I want to thank you so much, Dan, sir, for for answering the questions and and for being so uh, uh, forthcoming and allowing this to even be recorded. So thank you so very much, sir. I'm going to um, on my end, I'm going to end the recording and and um, uh, I'll just take a minute or two uh, off uh, off air to, to chat with you. But thank you so much again, sir. <laughs> Let's make it a shareable wave. Okay. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you, sir. Stop the recording.